All right, welcome everybody. So my name is Martin Koning, and I work in the technology office at uh, Wind River. And we work on technologies that are a little bit in front of or beside where the company um, is currently operating. And uh, the reason I'm here at the Linux Foundation and Open Source Summit is because we are slowly and surely becoming an open source company. You know, we have the number one commercial embedded Linux based on Yocto, and we have a hardened cloud platform based on Linux, Starling X, and uh, Kubernetes and OpenStack. And, you know, the traditional RTOS um, use cases where you have standalone VxWorks, standalone RTOS uh, running on the CPU cluster um, is being relegated a bit more towards, well, safety and hard real time and not so much general purpose compute for a number of reasons that I'm going to cover. And I'm going to start by um, talking a little bit about those meta trends that are driving um, CPU architecture for embedded, especially for edge devices um, that are connected and how that is affecting the way we do system architecture. And also um, what that might mean for um, the future for uh, how we're assembling software. And so we'll start with that broad, um, that broad context, and then we'll go deep a little bit on some proposed partitioning technologies that can use Verdi leverage Vert.io um, for hypervisorless uh, Vert.io in particular, which you think is quite interesting for assembling uh, multiple CPU clusters into collaboration fabrics within the, SO, within the SOC. So, of course, historically, you know, we would develop, test, ship our embedded devices you know, within the industry and never see them again. Um, and now with connected devices, they live on and so we have to update them and that brings requirements around um, security and connectivity and protocols. And also these, the fact that uh, you can update them can mean you're bringing in new features and sometimes you need to partition out those new features and so the platforms are slowly and surely becoming integration platforms. And that means that it's interesting to have a little bit more separation from the software space and the hardware um, so that you can assemble these partitions into uh, working systems and reuse those components from one variant of a product to the next. And um, so basically, back in the day, something like an infusion pump, it would have a fixed function, be a fixed function medical device that people would uh, connect themselves up to to exchange blood. And um, it would do that very well and very safely. But now those same devices have to be integrated into the hospital's infrastructure for the purposes of credential management, um, for the purposes of, um, of validating like into, into a patient database to validate uh, the settings. And uh, not, so not just for IT, but also part of the whole business of running a hospital, probably for billing also. And so that means that the amount of software that you need is a lot more than just the fixed function, the dedicated system of operating an infusion pump. It's becoming, you know, this, this entire world into itself to integrate into a, basically a business deployment. And that's the same across all the vertical markets. So we're seeing robot arms that have to integrate into hospital, uh, sorry, into factory infrastructure. Cars are integrating into, are becoming a transportation services platforms. So, you know, that one day we'll just be subscribing to transportation service so that you don't have to, you know, worry about charging your car if your car runs out of juice, maybe you, at the charging station, you just get into the next vehicle that belongs to the company that's operating the fleet that you subscribe to. And, and these paradigms are changing how we need to think about, like these business paradigms are changing how we need to think about the amount of value, how we, how we create it, how we deliver it, and how we capture it in the, in the software. <clears throat> so the problem is, basically, how do we engineer huge amounts of software into edge devices, given that you know, these modern multi-core SOCs are specialized, complex, in many cases heterogeneous, and the software that has to go into these devices is quite diverse. You have open source, you might have real-time um, elements, safety uh, pieces, and uh, even licensed software, and bring them together in a structured way. Um, so, and also maybe enable the ability of the component tree to be carried forward and reused um, so that you can 
amortize the NRE across multiple uh, product variants. So this brings us to element separation, right? We need some way of saying, well, this is a software element and that is a software element and we can combine them. And the reasons to combine them are for CICD. We, when you update something, you want to only update the thing that's changed and not the whole system. Similarly, if you have something that's stable, you don't want to be updating that. You want to just carry it forward into your next product. Fault propagation prevention is another reason to have a partitioning technology, because so if something fails, the fault can't propagate into some other active entity. Uh, resource allocation is another good reason to have a, an entity to um, uh, put a box around your software so that you can say, well, I want this part of the system to have this much CPU, this much memory, or this much bandwidth. And similarly, for privilege management, you want to have, um, use best practices such as lowest privilege for um, you know, some function so that it doesn't have the keys to, to everything. It can only uh, have the privilege needed for what, it, what it's actually doing. So then, um, so we have all these requirements, and then there's what's going on in the whole computer industry. Uh, of course, Moore's Law is ticking along, and I didn't think I was going to be mentioning Moore's Law ever again, but somehow is relevant. And uh, Moore's Gap, you know, that's the expectation that we have around performance. And I know Moore's Law doesn't talk about performance, but this Moore's Gap is, is you know, this expectation that's driving us towards multi-core SOC. So I just want to talk a little bit about that so that we can look a bit into the future. Um, software complexity, I mentioned software partitioning uh, is, is the solution uh, there. Uh, time to market, cost of ownership, that's driving us all to open source. Hardware enablement is driving us to Linux. And you know, this chip again, um, the fact that it's getting difficult for uh, device manufacturers to get the chips um, because of the whole chip again situation uh, it might actually motivate some designs to move more to um, sort of hardware consolidation so you have less parts in your devices and to value silicon independence a little bit so you can substitute parts more easily um, and not be beholden upon a, a specific SKU. So let, let this Moore's Law thing, um, you know, back in the day when we got more transistors to put into an SOC, we used those, the hardware designers used those for creative new features in the chips, you know, caching, pipelining, superscalar, all kinds of multi-threading, out of order and speculative execution features, and for pulling peripherals into the chip. Well, then we got this Moore's Gap where, you know, Denard scaling kind of stopped uh, allowing us to have you know, the power density. Um, Denard scaling basically states that power density is a constant even when the, semi, when the transistors get smaller. And so you can lower the, you know, the voltage and the current and increase the frequency and, and uh, get better performance. Um, and that sort of broke down a long time ago, like 15 years ago. And so now um, the solution to um, leveraging more transistors to get performance is more about specialization and having exactly the right kind of cores for the workload. And so that's brought in into the SOCs, you know, GPUs and NPUs and, and real-time processors, compute islands, safety islands, in some cases lockstep cores. Um, <clears throat> and so that's, that's where that's going and that's just gonna, gonna continue. Um, <clears throat> so we're clearly in the era of complex, heterogeneous, multi-core SOCs at the edge. Meanwhile, you know, this, this is a graph here or a slide from the automotive industry. Cars are basically software-defined vehicles now, and they're, and they're claiming that uh, the lines of code are uh, 10x every decade. And in continuing, to, some are predicting you know, 500 to a, a billion lines of code by 20 by 2030. So there's a lot of complexity being driven into some of these um, devices. And uh, can you imagine uh, with hardware consolidation, um, without having a, a good technology to integrate all of that software together, um, it would be an uh, untenable situation. Of course, the, so the re remedy is partitioning. And, and as software architects, we want to have a strong foundation for partitioning our software so that we can you know, accommodate future requirements, um, we can reuse components, we can uh, manage constraints, we can compose, configure, and enforce policy, and we have some structure and organization to the, to the system. And, and so we love, we love um, 
partitioning technologies, whether it's you know, li libraries, kernel modules, programs, packages, containers, or virtual machines, and even multiple runtimes running in the, in the SOC, it helps us do a divide and, divide and conquer. And at the same time, um, there's all these other aspects that are happening to us as software architects. Free and open source software is becoming free Linux open source software. You know, and portability is waning a little bit, so it's because open source projects are using the features of Linux, and so there's less uh, use of things like configure to, to um, configure software to alternate runtime environments. Uh, bring your own OS, sorry about that acronym, you know, where people want to have bespoke OS instances that are configured exactly for their o application and integrate those into a system, whether it's using a virtual machine or it's a container um, or it's uh, running on, a, on some kind of a compute island. Um, that's, that's in vogue. And you have all these abilities, and I'm not going to go through them all, that as software architects we have to consider and deal with. Um, and meanwhile, ready-made software is coming, you know, platforms as binaries, um, middleware, uh, trusted you know, software with provenance that we're going to uh, be able to uh, stream in to our systems, and uh, etc. You know, so we have a lot to deal with as, as software architects. And so the reality is that edge devices are going to increasingly contain Linux. You know, and I have a little uh, pr a proof here around that. You know, edge devices have all this open source middleware, ready-made applications that are increasingly only available on Linux. Board support packages for edge devices are increasingly only available for Linux. It's because the board manufacturers and SOC vendors are doing board support packages and drivers for Linux and not for other operating systems. And, and you know, meanwhile, the SOC designers are drag and dropping VHDL and cranking out SOCs faster and faster so that it gets more difficult for any OS vendor who is not leveraging Linux drivers and Linux BSBs to consider supporting the matrix of pain um, that's across all these SOC variants. Um, and so that's driving things towards Linux. And porting code from Linux is increasingly problematic because of the reasons mentioned previously that um, you know the drivers are, are written for Linux. Well, they're GPL, you can't bring those into commercial operating systems. Um, the, the code for the low-level code is using features of Linux, and so uh, porting is increasingly problematic. So therefore, devices will increasingly contain an instance of Linux, um, QED, which is you know, the, the English for quite easily done. So uh, meanwhile, intelligent edge devices need to deal with reactivity, real-time safety, um, planes, trains, automobiles, drones, robots, uh, the medical devices. Uh, we need to ha have the ability to run these payloads. So if edge devices will contain Linux, where are these payloads going to run? Well, they're going to run on Linux, if they can, right? And over time, Linux will be able to run more of those payloads. If Linux can't run the payload, well, then we need to run it somewhere else. And there's still a window of opportunity for alternate runtimes to, to help Linux. You know, we can call those auxiliary runtimes. So, and they could run, for example, in a virtual machine beside Linux on a, with a hypervisor. They could run on a compute island, whether it's a real-time compute island or it's a uh, safety-based compute island. Maybe it's uh, lockstepped. Um, it could even run on a dedicated core that's in the same CPU cluster that Linux was running, um, that Linux is running on. And I'm, I'm going to talk a bit about that. Um, that one's a little tricky. Uh, I know some call it static partitioning or whiteboard partitioning where you sort out, well, you know, Linux is going to have these peripherals and I'm going to map this one into some bare metal engine on a core. Um, but it is a possibility, so it's sort of more there for completeness. But let me just walk you through how that one works because it can be a little um, confusing. Basically, you, boot, you can boot up Linux across all the cores. You can use CPU hot plug to um, take a core away from Linux. And then you, you load a bare metal image into some memory that that core has access to. And you can use some technique, um, architecture independent. You know, on Intel, we've been using K probes. On ARM, you can use. Um, PSCI to 
activate the core at the entry point of that image. And now um, that image, as long as it's only using per core resources, you know, the per core t um, timers, interrupt controller, MMU, et cetera, and whatever real-time device that you've mapped directly into that, uh, that payload, which is not um, hopefully conflicting with runtime uh, running on, on Linux, um, then you can achieve uh, a real-time environment on a core uh, in the same cluster as, as Linux. And, and we've done that. Um, so it, it's, it's definitely an option. But it's more there for completeness because it's a lot of rope and it's quite dangerous, uh, um, susceptible to uh, configuration error. So here's kind of the whole landscape of options to run uh, real-time and safety workloads with Linux. Core reservation, this is where you use Linux features to pin some thread to a core. And that thread could be running a user-level process, it could be a, a, you know, a unikernel, which is hopefully offloading system calls from Linux and dealing with them locally to reduce um, uh, traps into the kernel. Could even leverage virtualization and have a vCPU that's running a real-time workload um, that's pinned to a, a reserved core. Of course, a preempt RT is helpful in all of those cases. Um, if not necessary, I guess it's necessary. Another scenario is core offload, which we mentioned, where you um, take a core away from Linux and you run your bare metal image on that. So that bare metal image could be um, a small executive. It could also be an executive running in a hypervisor that's just on that core. And that won't stop Linux from you know, resetting the image. So you can't use that for safety, but it, it will stop that low level image from killing Linux, which is um, pr probably more likely because uh, you know, uh, Linux is quite field tested. And if you're developing some custom application, you'll, you're likely to have bugs over in that low level payload um, more commonly than in the Linux kernel. Um, another scenario is to take those two uh, runtimes, whether it's a real time, a payload or a safety payload and run them on a hypervisor that is across all of the cores in the cluster. And so we'll call that uh, you know, virtual partitioning. And the final option here is uh, physical partitioning where you're using compute islands, right? And these complex heterogeneous SOCs are more common or are increasingly providing um, real-time and safety compute islands that have their own cache memory um, and are completely free of interference from the uh, main CPU cluster. So general guideline, if you're looking for tens of microseconds of real time, you can use Linux on the main CPU cluster with the real time um, preempt RT patches, uh, which actually aren't patches anymore now that they've been integrated into kernel, kernel.org and to the main line, which is uh, great. If you want more than or less than that for your latency, so you want a microsecond-ish hard real time, then you're probably at this point still looking at um, offloading the payload and, and leveraging an auxiliary runtime um, on a compute island or in a VM running on a real time hypervisor. And if you want safety, same sort of thing, you would deploy your workload on a, compute, on a safety island um, or in a VM with a safety hypervisor. So here's a use case um, that is kind of interesting and maybe a little counterintuitive, but um, and may possibly even slightly controversial. But uh, think about running like an auxiliary runtime on KVM on a core that's reserved for this one vCPU that's running the RTOS. Now you might think, well, hang on a sec, if K if it VM exits into KVM and KVM is running some non-deterministic code, well, that, that's a problem. But let's look at it the other way around and say, well, what if 100% of the instructions were running in the RTOS, right? And the RTOS was taking direct interrupts, um, had its own local peripherals for its application, um, then it's not VM exiting in its normal data path. And if it's an RTOS, therefore it can be real time within the, you know, on that core. Now, of course, the challenge is trying to um, receive and acknowledge interrupts without doing any, a VM exit. And um, so this is something, this is a place where maybe we need to 
uh, provide some feedback to the silicon manufacturers to enable this, but it would allow us to have a virtualized real-time payload with Linux running across the entire CPU uh, cluster. And so uh, it's up there more, uh, you know, as as an interesting scenario. We have um, you know, done this and measures the, the real-time performance, and it does take some VM exits, um, but uh, it does provide, um, you know, the 10-ish microsecond, similar to what you'd expect with um, with uh, preempt RT. And, and so that's a, a perfectly valid uh, use case for uh, enjoying the simple, easy Linux boot up experience across all the cores and still being able to deploy an auxiliary runtime um, w within the cluster. So once you're partitioning like this, the question is, well, now how do you have your runtimes collaborate? You know, Printf, incredibly important today. You need to be able to see what's coming out of your console. You might even want to be able to get access to the serial port uh, for the console or the, uh, the serial stream to uh, issue some commands and, and interact with your uh, real-time or safety payload. Um, that payload may want to read or write Linux files and it might want to send messages to the part of the system that is not real-time or safety and you know, this is, this is going to be, what you're going to want to do is only run the real-time or safety part of the payload um, you know, on the RTOS or the safety OS. You're going to want as much of that application to be on Linux. Um, and so you still, you'll be split across the different runtimes and you want some common way of um, having them collaborate. So the de facto approach for that is to use TCP IP. That's a pretty heavyweight thing to be doing within an SOC. You're using a WAN protocol to be sending messages between runtimes um, that could even be in the same CPU cluster or from a compute island to the main CPU cluster. So the question is, can we use VertIO for intra-SOC workload integration? VertIO is already available both in Linux and in many runtimes. It's an open specification that's transport independent in that it can run on PCI or MMIO. It has AFVSOC, which is quite interesting um, since it's similar to AFINet, and you can provide a socket API with it. And our experiments are, sh are showing that it's 10x faster than TCP IP over VertIO. And it can be run over shared mo memory without a hypervisor. That's why this talk is called hypervisorless VertIO, is because if you're, instead of going and doing traps down to a hypervisor, if instead you use VertIO over a shared memory and go across from the shared memory to a daemon process running on Linux on another core, then you don't need a hypervisor and you can actually leverage the VertIO devices and the VertIO specification um, without a hypervisor. And, and that's kind of a novel way to use VertIO, but uh, um, it, it has promise and it does work. So uh, VertIO also has low-level devices and higher-level services like file systems as well. And so it, uh, it's a good multi-device sp open specification for integrating runtimes at a, lower, at a low level and at a slightly higher level with file systems as well. So the thesis for our, um, the POC that, that, uh, that we've been working on was can we um, use VertIO on both x86 and ARM without a hypervisor, just use interrupts between the cores, uh, leverage um, the, a VMM, and we chose a KVM tool as the v VMM um, to be the back end for VertIO, and then get good performance with that. And so that means that we had to um, add some support for MSIs to KVM tool and enable vhost based VSOC and, uh, and network, VertIO net. Um, in, in the system. And then what we did is we took out the opening of, KV, of dev KVM for the configurations where you're doing um, compute islands and talking over a shared memory to a compute island. Uh, we still call it LKVM, even though it doesn't open KVM. Um, but uh, that's, uh, that's how we leverage KVM tool to be the KVM back, uh, simple C-based KVM backend. Here's the generalized architecture for this. So basically you have a shared memory between your auxiliary runtime and the KVM tool uh, daemon running on Linux. And the partitioning can be any of those four scenarios, core reservation, core offload, 
virtual partitioning or compute islands. So you have the same system architecture, regardless of which way you're assembling your, your system at the hardware level. And as software architects, we like to have flexibility and reuse. And so that's, it's quite interesting to be able to unify all of those different partitioning technologies with a single, <clears throat> um, a, a, sim, a, a single mechanism, uh, hypervisorless VertIO. So with standard VertIO, with these down calls down into the VMM, um, and in, for example on KVM, uh, there's, there's these VM exits and traps that are happening as you're interacting with uh, VertIO devices. But with hypervisorless VertIO, there's nothing to trap to. So instead, you're writing into the shared memory and then updating these device registers for the VertIO uh, devices. And something has to process that. So what you do is after you do those uh, register updates to the virtual VertIO devices, you send an interrupt over to the, uh, what we call the PMM, the physical machine monitor, um, and it goes and processes that update. Now it has to poke around and look at the device registers to see what's changed, and so that can add some overhead, but it's, uh, it can be um, remediated by using MSIs, and I'll talk about that a little bit on another slide. So in the shared memory, uh, basically the way that's laid out is uh, with device tree fragments uh, for each of the device headers. And uh, the ones that, uh, that, that we've been leveraging are the 9P for file system, uh, VSOC for IPC, uh, the VirIO console. VirIO net, we started with that, uh, but once we got VSOC working, um, we were preferring to use VSOC because it's faster. And, um, and it just seemed like we could reduce the amount of code needed in the auxiliary runtime by eliminating the TCP IP stack. So this might provide some clarity as to where the shared memory is in each of those four scenarios of core reservation, core offload, mixed criticality systems with the virtual partitioning and compute islands. Um, and basically the non-real-time, non-safety services are all provided on Linux with this kind of a system architecture and the real-time and safety services are provided on the auxiliary runtime and they reach across to access file systems and um, to provide their serial, their console and to do the uh, IPC. So we started off with you know, printf, then we added the AFI net uh, socket family with the uh, VertIO network and then moved to the uh, AF uh, VSOC and removed the IP stack requirement. That could actually be interesting for safety-based systems because it'd be a lot less code to certify. So you wouldn't need a certified network stack to do socket-based communications in these complex SOCs where you have Linux. Uh, it could just be communicating over um, VSOC to, uh, to Linux. Now, there would have to be some changes made to the way the vert queues are implemented. So you have safe IPC you know, with... Uh, you know, one-way channels so that there isn't fault propagation paths between your safety runtime and Linux. And uh, uh, we haven't done that yet, but that's an interesting area to, to pursue um, to implement this for safety-based systems. So I covered this, I think, you know, in a hypervisorless deployment, the hardware mechanism is uh, interrupts to send the VertQ uh, device notifications across between the runtimes. Upon receiving the hardware notification, the, um, from, the, from the front end, uh, Linux delivers um, notification to the PMM via uh, event ID, uh, event FD, I should say. And the PM, PMM then goes around and looks and sees what device status uh, fields have changed and updates uh, its, its copy of those registers and handles the request. And at the same time, or if that offload can be handled with vhost, it then uh, acts as a vhost proxy and, and punts it over to the Linux kernel for, for processing. So um, similar to how NAT and, uh, sorry, how NCAT and SOCAT uh, do port proxying, it could be interesting to add this feature to KVM tool so that it, uh, it could proxy TCP ports to VSOC uh, for hypervisorless VertIO situations so that you could, for example, uh, GDB or auxiliary runtime um, to, by connecting to its TCP port, which KVM tool would then accept that connection and then proxy that over VSOC to the auxiliary runtime, um, or vice versa. So you could do client server in, in either direction without actually having to have a TCP IP stack on the auxiliary runtime. 
and this is probably one of the next things that uh, that we'll be implementing in our in our KVM tool implementation. So, side note on the performance of VertIO MMIO with MSIs. Um, without MSIs, uh, we, there are a lot of traps that happen when you are modifying VertIO registers with the VM exits into the into the a VMM that has to process those. Um, and to reduce those, you can use MSIs on a per device basis so that uh, the, instead of having all these device uh, register changes, you can send the little bits of information that you want to um, signal to the PMM uh, in the MSIs. And that way you can eliminate a lot of these VM exits. And you can see here the number um, for the signals that go to the, the back end um, can, can actually be doubled with MSIs. We're going from 660,000 in the far second, uh, farthest right column to one point, uh, almost 1.2 million. And uh, that's because uh, you're sending more useful packets across. Uh, that's why the number is increasing there. And so if you compare this to the performance levels that VertIO PCI gets, you know, PCI, of course, is sort of the preferred way to do VertIO on x86. Um, you can actually achieve it with MMIO with MSIs. And that's quite interesting because the amount of code needed to implement a PCI um, driver and transport for VertIO is a lot bigger than simple shared memory. So if there is interest in reducing the amount of code in a VMM um, or, or a PMM scenario, uh, then uh, the recommendation would be to use MSI-based uh, MMIO transport instead of PCI. All right, some conclusions. So partitioning systems at the OS instance level using virtual machines, containers, and auxiliary runtimes uh, helps deal with edge device software complexity. Linux-based system architecture is increasingly used at the edge, and auxiliary runtimes for real-time and safety partitioning can sometimes help. Um, it's maybe less in the future as Linux uh, gets better at real-time and uh, perhaps even safety. Compute islands can avoid the need for virtualization to enable real-time or safety workloads with Linux-based systems. Hypervisorless VertIO can help unify workload integration for the various partitioning scenarios involving auxiliary runtimes on multi-core SOCs. And the Socket API can um, unify TCP IP communication and higher speed VSOC based local IPCs. So this work was done as part of the Lenaro uh, Open AMP Application Services Working Group. And the um, KVM tool changes can be found um, at this GitHub URL. And there's more information that can be found under the OpenAMP project uh, in the news. And um, if people are interested in the MMIO MSI support for KVM tool um, to accelerate that transport, uh, you can find that at, uh, at this URL here. This work was um, and is sponsored by uh, Wind River. Wind River is a cloud native um, DevSecOps platform for the development, deployment, operation, and servicing of intelligent systems. And if you're interested in learning more about that and how it can um, do payload generation for a complex heterogeneous multi-OS systems, um, you can find information for that at uh, the link on, on the slide. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Yes. Named pipes or? FIFO. Oh, FIFOs. Yeah. So the question is, um, are named pipes or FIFOs an alternative to VSOC? Yeah. So um, they could be. They could be. And VSOC is particularly attractive because you can do a one-to-one -one mapping to TCP IP and carry forward all of the clients and servers that use TCP IP so, uh, without having to make code changes, and that has huge value. But I do like the simplicity of FIFOs, especially for safe IPC. 
actually has a lot more, I expect, it did a lot more than I expected it to. Yeah, so. The so, so flight is just a character device, it's just put some information in and the host gets it immediately. It's like, a, yeah. like you said, that one direct call, and on the host you'll see a, you know, flight in, flight out, on the guest it's a character device that you just read or write to. Yeah, so there was a follow-up comment that um, VSOC implementation in the guest goes through a work queue which causes context switch and has overhead in the guest. Um, however, that, uh, that is actually a property of the guest and it's possible to implement VSOC in the guest using alternate implementations without work queues and without context switching. Um, and so the, the, I, you, might, you, must have been the, you must have been looking at a Linux guest. Yeah, yeah. Like, right. right, thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Stefano. Have you, um, have you looked at something like Targo? I know that Targo is designed for hypervisor originally, but maybe it's possible to make it work in a hypervisor mesh environment as well, with um, as long as there is a component that can do the, co the same copy for you. I'm thinking because the, the API is, is a lot deeper and it's just one step above a simple ring buffer, so you know, in the direction of the type of question. Right. So the question was, have, have we looked at Argo as a way to simplify the transport at the lowest level between the runtimes, right? And, um, as it, because it could simplify the, instead of using vertQ implementation, have a path potentially to safety. And I do think that is something that should uh, be looked at and is a very interesting question. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, thank you everyone.